Hi everyone, Jennifer Eklund from Piano Pronto here with my lovely co-author Chris Skaletsky of Kitty Keys. She and I co-authored Road Trip, uh, my musical memory book, which is a primer level piano method book. Uh, we published this book back in June 15, June of 2015 rather, and uh, we have the second installment of Road Trip coming out uh, in the spring of 2016. Uh, we wanted to host this little impromptu webinar today um, to address some questions that have come up about Road Trip and to also offer some important teaching strategies uh, for many of the songs that you'll find in the Road Trip Method book. Um, so Chris and I, uh, we share a lot of views. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them is that we both believe in real music right away uh, in the early process of uh, piano lessons. Um, you'll find that everything in Road Trip is easily taught by rote, by note, and by number, and this has a lot to do with our shared belief in what we refer to as assumed competence, and I think I'll turn it over to Chris to talk a little bit more about that. So assumed competence, competence is really just um, a teaching to the highest point and then adjusting as necessary for the student. So, uh, for example, if I had a student who uh, was really struggling with uh, fingers number two and three in the application of that, um, I could take that song and scale it back, but always aiming at the high, highest point and then scaling the lesson back to um, appropriately meet that student where they are. But we always want to go in with the belief that they can, which is part of the reason the songs begin on the staff right away for Road Trip, um, because they can be taught by rote or by note. Um, always going in with the, the philosophy, with the belief that the child should be taught at the highest point possible, and then meeting the child where they are in further teaching. Right, and it's another reason. Uh, we don't shy away from using Italian terminology mm -hmm. in the road trip book. We keep everything within a very limited scope, so they're learning things like forte and piano, but we recycle and reuse these mm -hmm. terms over and over again, that it just becomes second nature to the student. Mm -hmm. And of course, students who are very young, they, they just soak everything in like mm -hmm. a sponge, so there's no reason that we can't use terms like allegro and lento and mm -hmm. forte and piano. Right, we right. don't need to make up games to remember everything. Right. It just is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, sometimes what teachers get hung up on, is they, they get too hung up on everything that's on the page and explaining it away. Right, right. You can always go back to the beginning songs and encapsulate some of those things that you didn't teach the first time. And maybe on that second pass or that third pass, that student might be ready for that very tempo marking or the dynamic marking or uh, interjecting other notes that were you took out the first time. Just because the music is written one way, it doesn't mean that you can't adjust it as needed for where that student is. If there's too many notes, too many chord notes and half notes in a measure, well, cross out that repeated chord note that maybe is bothersome and on that that second pass or that third pass put it back in and that will give the student that sense of mastery that they really need to feel that comfort and competence so that they can move forward again you're teaching to the highest point that they can assumed competence doesn't mean you have to put everything in there we're assuming they can, but then again, adjusting as needed for that student that's sitting with us at the piano. Right, and I think that, that um, when we came up with the concept of the road trip, I think we think about these philosophies in our teaching styles, but also about the road trip itself. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to see a lot of trees on your road trip, but maybe the first tree you see, you're not going to remember everything about mm -hmm. it, but you pass a lot of other trees along the way. Sometimes we circle back and see the same trees again, and we start to notice different things. Mm -hmm. um, for me and my piano Pronto books, I talk all the time with teachers about what I refer to as situational experience, um, which is really such a, an important thing for beginning level students that they, they are introduced to all of these concepts, half notes, whole notes, quarter notes, what a C looks like on the staff. But it's not enough that we say these things in words. They need to see these items in action mm -hmm in many different contexts. Mm -hmm. So I'm very, very <clears throat> much a believer in showing them these foundational things in music theory and showing it in many different contexts so that they start to kind of connect those dots and see how it's how it's all put together. Exactly, and I think that's the one of the biggest reasons that it's important to get them off of the bench so that, uh, you know, we, we hear teachers talk about, you know, focusing, focusing on songs mm -hmm. as they're playing them and how can they um, bring that child and rein in their attention to what they're working on. Well, you may need to step away from the bench 
and turn on some music, turning on one of the backing tracks as an example, mm -hmm. and get them up and moving and marching or playing an instrument or even just clapping. Uh, we talked uh, this past weekend about air piano, putting the lid down and playing it and, and focusing just on a good hand position and um, uh, trying to find alternate ways to to uh, internalize the beat or work away from the piano. Um, often when a child is having tr struggles focusing, they need to shake their wiggles up. They really just have to get off the bench. And even if that means, you know, you may not want to march or I would be inclined to dance. I'm okay with that. Um, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> She's been dancing. Um, <laughs> get them off the piano, turn on some music, you know, just turn on a CD that you have nearby, but ideally the backing tracks and let them march around the room, you know, give them a drum or let them clap their hands or a bell or something like that. Um, you know, don't, I would encourage you to participate in that with them. It's much easier for a child when there's someone doing that with them. A lot of teaching small children is really in essence kind of acting, um, you know, being your, being an active and participant in the students' lessons. So often that whole idea of focus can really be um, allayed by getting them away from the bench a little while, shaking some of those wiggles out of them, and then inviting them back to the piano after you've maybe explored the concept another way. Right. Great. So uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to kind of walk through um, from the beginning uh, of the student book uh, for the first road trip book and just talk briefly about some of the songs. Um, the, the opening set of pages, um, we have two pages that are open with a lot of activities on them. Um, we have the welcome to your road trip page on page one. We have your opening rhyme. Uh, and then there's activities for the student, the three favorite things I'm packing, you know, they're supposed to draw at this point. Who's going along with you? They list who they're going with. So this is a very um, busy uh, activity filled set of pages. So what Chris and I would recommend is that you just sort of skip over, um, you read the opening rhyme. Uh, because that's you know the way to get everyone excited about what what the, about the journey that we're about to embark on, um, and you get over to page two and you just go through that road trip final checklist. And this is just you know a fun thing mm -hmm. that Chris and I created. You know that you're taking your pencil with you. Check. I got my swimsuit. Check. I've got my thinking cap. Check. Okay, and that's enough. So you read your verse. You do your checklist and you turn the page and get going with the music. Because mm -hmm. again, real music <clears throat> right away. Mm -hmm. The idea with your piano lessons is that we're playing the piano and that we're doing things. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to get bogged down in that uh, opening spread of pages, you know, mm -hmm. with all of this drawing, because otherwise your, your lesson time is going to be up. Yep. You can always revisit it and go back. Yeah, but don't feel compelled to complete the introduction. Right. We want them playing the piano. Right, absolutely. Um, so with the road trip song, um, you know, we have this extensive teacher guide. Uh, teacher guidebook that's full of you know multiple duet versions for these songs. We also have free backing tracks um, for for the road trip book on the website. Uh, we're really going to encourage you to utilize both um, for younger children who again have a bit more of the wiggle syndrome mm -hmm. going on. Um, we're really going to encourage you to utilize those backing tracks uh, more often probably even than, than the teacher duets, um, because the, the distinct advantage of the backing tracks is that you can put them on and then you can play the right. student part with, with the, student. the student. And again, you know, it, you may need to assist a mm -hmm. lot. You may need to help the student physically feel where these whole notes are happening in right. song number one. Meeting and, them where they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Chris, you had some other suggestions for things to do before they even get on the piano. Right, right. With this song. Right, and, and kind of taking that idea again of away from the bench, putting the lid down on the piano, um, or moving to a hard surface, and using their left hand finger too, <laughs> and counting out those Cs. You could say C, two, three, four, C. We want to give them the resistance, and that's why a hard surface works so well for that. Um, putting the backing track on. Um, I'm not sure if Jennifer has mentioned we're having somebody sing along with the, the CD, the songs. So we'll actually be able to able to take that task, if you will, of singing along with your playing and following along the words, kind of out of your uh, basket of tricks. Um, you're welcome to sing along, but we'll have um, somebody actually physically doing the singing for you. Um, so we want them to um, use the backing track, use a hard surface, move it there. Um, you could, again, use the marching away from the piano and match, march, have them clap and hold. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Again, you're prepping them for the 
It's a very simple rhythm, but internalizing that beat, prepping them for what they're going to play before they sit at the piano. Um, and certainly the teacher tips um, that are in the teacher guide, you know, finding C and really associating with a strong association from the beginning and finding that C by any two black keys on the piano is important, I think. Right. Uh, and something with the, <clears throat> with the teacher duets, um, of course, the first time through with a student, you're going to want to utilize the very bare bones version of the teacher duet. Um, you, may, you may need to scale it down even farther. Um, it may be as simple as hitting one chord and counting out those four beats for the student. Mm -hmm. um, it is probably over ambitious to think that you are going to play the melody part and they're going to be below you playing this ostinato bass note. That's not the point yeah. of this song. The point of this song is to get them to start internalizing the beat. And that's going to take time. This is, uh, Chris had a great analogy the other day um, talking about um, letting the cement set mm, the in foundation. the foundation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're trying, really trying to build a foundation for future piano lessons, all future lessons. So when you pour the foundation of any building, you need to make sure it's solid, well laid out, well braced up so that anything that you build in the future has a solid foundation, you know, from which to to go up and rise up. So really beginners are sometimes, well, they are the hardest to teach because there's so much that we need to put into those lessons to build that good foundation. But it's so important to take the time to work on hand position and a, and a loose wrist or whatever whatever terminology you use as you're teaching that, the rhythms and, and note names and the staff and, and how things, the pattern of the, the geography of the keys, that's also important that we should never minimize the importance of breaking it down as far as we need to for students so that they can set up their foundation so that you know they have the best chance for a success as they move on to more advanced um, piano pieces. Yes, right. <laughs> okay, so the next song we're going to talk about, uh, probably the crowd favorite in the book, mm -hmm. it's Beep Beep Beep, uh, which is basically just mimicking a car horn. Um, you kind of can't go wrong with this song. And that's a really important teaching strategy in mm -hmm. itself. You need to, as a teacher, you need to maximize the songs that are crowd favorites with students. And usually when you have a song that is a crowd favorite within your studio, um, that is the time where you can uh, utilize the fact that students will not mind going <coughs> back <coughs> and playing a piece over and over right. and over and over again uh, in order to reassess things, um, really get in under the hood and talk about the details on the page. Um, beep, beep, beep is also a great opportunity um, to get into talking about the touch on the, on the keys. Um, students will go back and play this song over and over again. I know you've had experience yes. in your studio with this. Right, right. Um, what we had fun with, a lot of students like to mash it up to other songs. So as they've gone through the book, um, because it's not always feasible as you get to the later stages of the book, to go back to the beginning and play every single song. But when we call out their favorites and beep, beep, beep is always at the top of the list. Um, I like to, they like to mash it up with another piece. You know, for example, Home Sweet Home. Um, in fact, I have several students playing that for recital. So uh, as Jennifer said, I think coming back to that foundational teaching, coming back and, and exploring tempo and dynamics and really digging into touch. Um, if you had an advanced student, if, if I could just now go into the whole idea of, let's say you have a student that you've had the first lesson with them and they really seem capable of moving more quickly. And so you get into uh, the, the road trip song, the first one. Well, a way to, you know, to to push that to another level is to double up and have them playing two C's, a left hand two, C with two and a right hand C with two. And it's instantly harder and then they're mastering that skill up together. Don't be afraid to assign a second lesson and beep, beep, beep would, would be one of those. To again, beef it up and make it harder for a student that, okay, they're really doing well with this. Maybe change one of those chord notes into two eighth notes. Let's see, see how far you can push them. Again, to the theory of assumed competence, if they're really making that mark or meeting that mark from the get-go, another way to beef it up is to change it into eighth notes. Do you need to? Absolutely not. You could assign a third lesson, but you know, to be creative and to look at the song and see other things that you can do. Rem again, remembering that we can always make it harder in the first measure. Draw in a whole note. Eliminate the rest and have them hold something there. But to layer and, and go back and, and to strip it down if you need to, maybe they only use the right hand finger number two and say beep, beep, beep. 
Maybe they need some left hand work. The same thing. Go through and have them play it with their left hand finger too before you bring it in together. Right. And I think a lot of those strategies <clears throat> also speak to getting the student off the page. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we are getting them on the staff and reading music right away. But music doesn't always have to be exactly what's on the page, and that's okay, because we, we are trying to spur on creativity with this book, um, with all of the coloring activities, and we, we are having them create their own musical scrapbook. Well, you know what? Music is creative, too, and we, we want them to explore uh, other options with these songs as well. So don't be afraid as a teacher to stray from what's written. Mm -hmm. We tried to give you a very flexible framework um, to work with here. And remember, the most important thing is that you guys are having fun in the lesson. Definitely. Um, okay, so next up uh, is the lullaby, uh, which is one of a handful of um, black key only songs in the first road trip book. Um, we just want to touch briefly on this one. Um, Again, real music right away. If you're playing in the key of D flat major, you have a D flat major key signature. As a teacher, we need you to not get hung up on this. It just is. We yeah. wanted to show students the way actual notation looks right from the get-go. The black key songs in Road Trip are meant to be taught by rote. That is why you will not find the letter note names inside the note heads on these songs. So they are rote based songs. That goes for songs number three, number five, and number seven. Now we like black key songs because uh, these tonal centers are lovely to listen to. It opens up the ears to uh, different tonalities. So they serve an important function. <laughs> Little fingers often have a much easier time playing up on the black keys. And we just wanted to offer a variety of uh, both tonal centers and, and variety in terms of um, solo material. Yeah, I'm going to agree with that. And I think um, playing up in those black keys uh, for a student that is uh, maybe dropping their thumbs or pulling back or has that tendency to hook, or I call them you know, monkeys hanging off the tree. Um, bringing them up into the black keys can lay that foundation for understanding mm -hmm. that we can play the, the scope of the white key. We don't need to be you know hanging onto the edge of it, but into those black keys is an appropriate Right, and I think yeah. you mentioned to me um, that the scarf activity with the right. lullaby works really well mm -hmm. for learning the dotted half note. Right, right. So the motion of the scarf is lightweight. Again, it's away from the bench. It's a one, two, three, one, two, three, using the backing track again and giving that beat or you could be playing a simple accompaniment um, but often I think it's really good to participate in those activities with the students so they can see um, you know we, we often forget that children don't have the vocabulary that we have so I could say alternate with the scarf and they don't necessarily know what the word alternate means mm -hmm. so I have to show them that I want them to go left and then right keeping in mind that when you're working with young children you'll often you'll want to opposite so you're going to go left and then go right because they're seeing you in opposite so you know mirroring and participating with them is a really great way for them to see um, because we we can't assume that they have our full adult vocabulary right okay great so we're going to move on um song number four uh which is stop rest <clears throat> go a great opportunity to play red light green light in your studio great way to get get the wiggles yep, out of those those out. little feet um um, so we have had, as some teachers mentioned, that this is a difficult piece uh, because of the rest. So we wanted to offer you a couple strategies for how you can break this down. And this is a strategy that you can use on many of these pieces. Mm -hmm. So uh, just keep that in mind. Um, this is a piece that has a quarter note on beats one and three, and then a quarter rest on beats two and four. Um, most often students will struggle with the note that's coming in on beat three. Um, because that timing is a little bit difficult to hear. So the very obvious solution here for your first pass at this song is to just play that quarter note on beat one. So you end up with one, rest, 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 one, rest, rest, rest. And so all you're doing is playing on the first beat of the right. measure. Mm -hmm. Again, we would strongly encourage you to do this with your student using a backing track instead of trying to uh, play the teacher duet. If you are having to break down the student score uh, because it's too difficult, uh, it is not the time to use the teacher duet. Uh, you need to use the support of the drum beat in the backing right. track. Take it away. Take it off the piano. Right. 
Put the lid down again. Oh, put the backing track and just do one, two, mm -hmm. three. So they can get the motion and the downbeat. They can internalize absolutely. that beat before they're making sound at the piano. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Remember, uh, the piano lesson process, it is a long journey. It is not a sprint. Um, you have plenty of time to come back and relive this song if they are mm -hmm. struggling with it. Right. And there is also a, a sense of uh, confidence building and mastery when a student comes back to something and all of a sudden what was difficult for them a few weeks prior is now easier and we can add to it. Right. That feels really good for a child. Um, you know, I think of in terms of Groundhog Day, if you've ever seen the movie where you keeps waking up and having to relive life. In our lives, it's very uncomfortable and disconcerting to have to do new things. We, you know, it feels very green. And if we think of a, a child, do they really in their life want to do something new every day, all the time, 24 hours a day? That could be really disconcerting, could be really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So that idea of going back and having them do something they've done before, it's going to be familiar to them. And familiar is going to be comfortable. Comfortable will be something they want to repeat because they feel that they've mastered something. So you know, going back and, and retackling and readdressing and, and doing things that they were really good at, don't always feel like we have to make it harder. It's, it's a good process. Okay, so uh, we're going to move on to song number six in the Road Trip book, uh, which is called We Made It to the Lake. Um, Chris and I, when we were writing Road Trip, we wanted to offer um, sort of some touchstone moments uh, for the students. So what we did is we used um, The Farmer in the Dell as the main Road Trip theme song. Um, the students experienced that as song number one. At that point, though, they are only playing a whole note C, and they are actually uh, the accompaniment pattern to the teacher or the backing track that is playing the melody line. So we are building on that in song number six with We Made It to the Lake. Um, they go back to that familiar melody of Farmer in the Dell, but this time uh, they are hitting the C in half notes and they have added a D and a G. They've got both hands going. So it's really important um, as a teacher that you take time when you get to this song to go back and relive song number one and remind them of the road trip theme song mm -hmm. uh, so that when you start to use the backing track or the teacher duet for song number six, uh, they can kind of tie that all together that we've, we've been on this journey and look, here's the same song again, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. uh, we are making it more complicated now. I mean, for, in terms of engaging families at home and mm -hmm. families in the practice, I think this is a really good point for a parent to almost see a little concert at home, if you will, a right. road trip recital, um, so that the child is sharing with the, the family or the parents um, how they played in the first song, what they were able to do then, and how much in just these few pieces they have advanced to the point of playing half notes. Um, it is important to engage the families, whether they're in lessons, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you're sending home uh, weekly emails, um, the travel log is a great tool, but it's only as good as the probably the communication that you're getting from your parents and the feedback. So I know that's a challenge. It's an age an age old issue. All of us have it as piano teachers. Well, and we we have it with students of any age. Right. Um, when we are talking about the young crowd. Uh, who can't read yet, obviously they're not going to go home and read their travel log. Uh, then you are relying on the parents mm, for definitely. support. And then it seems as soon as they are of reading age, we kind of throw the parents out of the equation. And then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. well, student, why are you not reading your assignment right, book? Right. But this is something that has happened for eons. Um, you know, we wish that we could wave our magic wand and all of a sudden you've got engaged parents and students <laughs> on all levels. Uh, that would be fantastic. I know, right? Um, probably not going to happen. So all we can encourage you to do as a teacher is just to to be as excited about the material as you can and uh, you know often parents just they they feel they feel out of their element especially if they don't have a musical background they feel maybe a little bit fearful to get involved with the practice process because they don't want to screw the kid up right yeah. right but I think that's where those backing checks will right. be helpful again Absolutely. if parents have access to them Road trip recitals, you know, I want you to go home and show, you know, yeah. pick your three favorite songs and have and play them for your mom and dad. And maybe that pulls the parents into the process as yeah. well, because we, we tend to forget to do that as students get older and having them perform for their family. It really does take up the parental parental involvement. But that's, if someone gets that figured out, I'd like to know too. Yeah, yeah I'd like a magic yeah. pill too. 
Um, the next piece that we want to touch base on is number eight, Skipping Stones. Uh, what I like about this piece is it gets them moving a little bit on the piano. Again, meeting a child where they are, if we're going for the home run of this, they're able from the get-go to put their thumb on C on the piano, uh, dressing in the third measure that their thumb will move to D, and then coming back in measure number four, back to the C. But let's say that's not going to be what happens with your student. Um, a couple of options for them is to uh, do something away from the piano first, that lateral movement, put the lid down, move to a hard surface, and uh, again, take the idea of note names or finger numbers out of the equation. Um, just talk about finger number one, putting the hand on the hard surface, and playing one, three, and five, and moving to the right one, three, and five. So they're getting that sense of moving to the right, moving to that side before we apply it to the piano. Um, another strategy would be to find the like measures, looking at measure one and two, and then looking again at measure four and five. They're the same. Uh, we like to think of it as compos compositional analysis. We can do compositional analysis with a student of this age. What do you see here? What, you know, they do it in Sesame Street, right? right. One of these two rings is not like the other. Well, what measures do you find here that are identical? And, and look at that with a child and then maybe take a pencil or a crayon and mark them off so that they're seeing it. And then practice measure one and two. Mm -hmm. And then go practice measure measure five four and, and five. Six. It's actually five, five, and, five six, and six, sorry. Um, and then having them review that and, and, you know, is this the same? Well, this is half the song. You've learned half the song. Yes. And then maybe adding in the, the measure seven and eight. Um, or And then finally going to three and four. Um, but creating a, a picture away from the piano first is an effective strategy if they're not ready for that type of movement on the piano. Right. I would encourage a, sort of a teamwork effort on this mm, one yes. as, as well. Um, once you find those like measures and they get comfortable uh, with measures one and two, uh, you can teamwork it together. You're on this journey together. Student starts with those first two measures and you, the teacher, plays measures three and four up an octave higher. It doesn't have to be right in their space. You don't. You can give them room. Um, so you can teamwork yourselves through the song and then again uh, add the backing track, teamwork style, play through the song. Um, on the teacher duets for this piece, uh, because I'm a jazz lover and <laughs> anyone who knows my music knows that I love a good bit of syncopation, uh, you are definitely going to want to um, use the simplest duet part for quite a while. Um, this is kind of a jazz waltz mm -hmm. feel. Uh, it can be a, a bit confusing for the student, um, but it sounds fantastic once they get it. And uh, if they practice you know, enough times with that backing track, the backing track itself is also syncopated. So they'll, they'll start to get that into their ears, but just... You know, remember to, to take your time with with everything. It's not a race to mm -hmm. the finish line. I want to say this about the backing tracks. Mm -hmm. It really will, if you're comfortable using them, it's going to help you to step away from that part of teaching and focus on teaching because that music's going to be going for you. The, mm -hmm. the singing will be part of that. So you can focus solely on what that student is doing with you, which is really the most important part of the, the lesson. Right. right. I think one of the things we hear most often from teachers, um, because I don't write the easiest duet parts in the world, <laughs> so they say, how on earth do I keep an eye on my student and I keep mm -hmm. an eye on all this? Um, you're right. There's a lot going on. It's going to sound fan fantastic once you get there, um, but it is a bit of a trick, you know, to keep an eye on a little a little person mm -hmm, down right. there with little fingers that like to, to wander around. So the backing tracks, they take so much pressure off of you. Mm -hmm. um, touching on this for just a moment, too, um, you know, somebody asked us a while back, uh, what do you do with uh, recitals uh, mm -hmm. for road trippers? Well, the backing tracks are a wonderful opportunity to really, you know, jazz up your recital. You get some drum beats going. It really wakes up the room instead of just piano solo after piano solo. That not that there's anything wrong with that, mm -hmm. um, but it really uh, is a fun and snazzy twist to, right. for a recital um, to get those going. You know, it's very easy to just have a little Bluetooth speaker there. They can fill a room easily. And uh, that's what you can do with your road trippers. You can offer them the support during a recital as well and just play their student part with them. So they have the support of you being there. Uh, and it's probably less confusing than trying to play a teacher duet with them in a recital situation, which is already, you know, sort of nerve wracking uh, mm -hmm. for, for young students. So that is what we would suggest for uh, road trip level students. Um, the Piano Pronto uh, Rising Stars book is also offers great options for recitals. These are um, very much on par with the road trip books. Very uh, simple student solos, um, all with teacher duets or uh, backing tracks available. So those are really nice um, recital options with pizzazz. 
you know, students come from a variety of places. Um, they all, some prefer to go at a slower pace, um, some a faster pace. And if you get a student who um, devours a, a lesson and is ready to move forward, um, supplementing with Rising Stars is a great option. The other thing is to not take it literally. A lesson doesn't mean that should be the only song or lesson that's taught at that lesson, um, feel free to move on. If you're teaching song number nine, Ice Cream Party, and uh, the student has really got a good grasp of the movement and playing it well with a solid beat, well then move on and assign number 10, Beach Bunny. Um, so you've got that latitude. Don't uh, hone in on a, a lesson and think, well, this is the only thing I can do in my class today with that student. Take them at whatever pace that they're ready to move at. Right, and I think too, uh, the teacher guide uh, offers you know a plethora of activities and options for every lesson. And if you tried to do all of that in a lesson, yeah, you'd only be getting through half a song in that lesson. <laughs> right. Um, you know, we purposely gave you more ideas than less ideas because I think it's more often than not that we hear, "What am I going to do with a four-year-old for a half an hour?" So we wanted to make sure you have plenty of things to to fill the time. But absolutely. Um, as a teacher, you need to use your intuition and you need to monitor the engagement level of the student. Um, if they are having a really easy time playing, I'm going to encourage you to keep them playing and keep moving through lots of material. Right. If they're struggling with playing, if a song is a struggle, you want to stave off that frustration level and make sure that you are moving from activity to activity quite quickly, um, getting them off the bench, getting them using their body uh, so that they're not just at the piano, especially if uh, being at the piano can be frustrating for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something else if I could add to that mm -hmm. is the incorporation of keyboard kickoff. So with all of my students who are four and up, probably eight or nine, um, they all get Rising Stars Road Trip mm -hmm. and keyboard kickoff. So I have the latitude to move around and as, in particular for a student who is breezing through material, um, I can give them some of those, those other pieces in that book. And eventually I have to kind of taper off and move back into Road Trip more, but it does give me a lot of latitude to move around um, and very the, the the what I'm giving them, what I'm serving them on their piano plate. Right, and again, it goes back to that situational experience, mm -hmm. seeing quarter notes in a variety of contexts, and seeing the notes on the staff in a variety of contexts and right. orders, because as you know, no two songs are ever identical right. in these early stages, right. but when they you know, it's like language usage. Uh, if you keep using it, uh, it just becomes second nature, mm -hmm. which is, again, a reason that we just show them real music right away on yeah. the staff. Because in the future, we're hoping that they stay with us, that uh, this is what they're going to be looking at. They're not going to be looking at off-staff music. Correct. They are going to be looking at music that mm -hmm. sits on yep. the staff. Yep. Review, review, review. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, with Ice Cream Party, uh, again, this song is a great opportunity, like Skipping Stones, um, for the student to find and identify uh, the measures that are the same. So every other measure in this piece uses that 3, 3, 2, 1 pattern. So again, we can teamwork it with our students and partner up as they're learning this. So you can help them reinforce that 3, 3, 2, 1 finger pattern and then you can play the next measure again stay out of their real estate and be up higher on the piano so they play you play they play you play so you get this call and response mm -hmm. going on and mm -hmm. then you can turn on that backing track and play through and accomplish the song together layering on top of that if they're ready you can start to add in other measures Layering on top of that, you can introduce the easiest version of the teacher duet into the mix. There, there are so many layering possibilities right. that you essentially, you keep them from getting bored with simple songs by, you know, continually building um, using the tracks and using all of these different varieties of teacher duets. Because right. by the time you get to version three of the, of the teacher duet, we've got a lot of syncopation. There's a lot going on in there. The student has to be very independent uh, in order for the two of you to pull that off together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, a, a tool, let's say that the song is too hard for the student when they get to it for you to use, again, that backing track or a duet. But probably the backing track is easier because it frees you up to work with the student. Take them off the piano. Give them a drum. Mm -hmm. Let them beat just quarter notes on every beat of the, of the song. It doesn't, the learning doesn't have to just take place at the piano. Again, the learning can take a place on a hard surface or away from the piano while you're marching or while you're moving. Um, 
there's just so many options that, you know, or maybe the takeaway from the lesson is tracking. Maybe they're watching that and they're beating on a, a drum, which is just easier for the student, but they are, are remembering that idea of tracking left, and left to right through the music. And, and that in, some, in itself for some students is the biggest takeaway that they can take also. All right, it's time to go. <laughs> All right, it is time to go. And I think something that we, we need to um, remember as piano teachers is that when we're working with young children, we, we have to be actors in a sense, right? If we're the tour guide, we're so much more than the piano teacher, which is awesome. But for really to really engage a student, we, we have to be on their level somewhat. We have to be thinking in terms of what do they need me to do? How can I make this come alive? And for me personally, it, it's helpful to, to sing along or to, um, to see where they are. What do they see? What do they, what do they think it's time to go is about? And how can we relate that to something in their life? Um, so I, I, I can't stress enough how I think it's important to have them learn the lyrics to the song. Um, again, you'd use the backing tracks for that and use that for a part of beekeeping. Beak it's time to go. I'm not supposed to sing, probably. <laughs> Usually I turn, turn the music, music on. on. <laughs> okay, okay. You have many other redeeming <laughs> qualities. <laughs> and there we go again. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think using that singing, um, first of all, if we're thinking about sound and producing good sound, well, maybe the child is going to be able to produce it with their voice and get that sense of movement that way. So again, I'm going to sing for just a second. Okay. It's time to go, to go. Are you hearing me go lower to higher? Can you hear that? Can you mimic that? And creating it with our voice is an option also um, before or in addition to creating at the piano. So we get that sense of high and low mm -hmm. away from the piano as right. well. Uh, this makes me think about a couple of things. Uh, throughout my teaching career, I, I recall getting a number of transfer students um, who had been with teachers who pretty much were, I would say, just dictators. They said, you, they say, you do it this way, it's going to sound like this, and never really uh, engaged the student in thinking about the piece of music. I had teachers like that. I remember when I got to college and all of a sudden I had a teacher who I thought was nuts who said, I want you to sing that line. And I was like, what? No, I sit on the piano bench and you tell me how to play this and that's that's the way this works. I think the beautiful thing about Road Trip, if you are very engaged as a teacher and asking lots of questions and yeah, you know, encouraging the, the child to sing, encouraging them to listen and to, to mm -hmm. really engage in the lesson, um, you are sending yourself as a teacher and all of the other teachers that you know will be blessed by having this student later in life that they will not sit there like a lump on the bench <laughs> because they have right well it was me yeah. I, I never wanted to open better. my I didn't know better because mm -hmm. I didn't have engaging teachers who you know encouraged me to be expressive I had plenty of students myself who would come and I'd ask them a question, well, what does this sound like to you? And they would just sit there and look at mm -hmm. me because they were just used to the teacher always telling them the answer. Mm -hmm. um, so again, we want to just you know encourage uh, early, this is like early music analysis, and we want them to understand what they're looking at. Rote teaching is not about here, we're going to show you this, now copy, and can mm -hmm. you remember it? It's about really learning what's on the page, what right. they're hearing, and what it feels like. Yeah. What do you see? Right. What do you think that sounds like? Right. Right. Exactly. exactly. All right, so song number 13 in Road Trip, Backseat Blues, is another crowd favorite. Um, kids love to play the E flat because all of a sudden everything sounds kind of creepy and cool. Um, so like beep, 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 we want you as a teacher to really maximize the fact that your students will not mind playing this song over and over and over again. Um, so if you have a student who's just eating up backseat blues and you can tell, oh, I can make them go back and play this, you know, four or five or 17 more times, um, this is a great opportunity uh, to maybe even gently introduce legato to a student. Uh, you don't necessarily, you don't need to talk a lot about it, um, but this is an opportunity that we would say, you know, put the fall board down and you want to start teaching the student about that smooth transfer with curved fingers from note to note to get that beautiful sound instead of just a plonk, plonk, mm -hmm. plonk. Right. right. Um, and because they'll be 
willing to play this song over and over again because they like it. Uh, it's a great opportunity uh, to talk about right. touch right. on the keys. If the student is not ready for that, you need to respect that. And remember, you, that is something you may be able to circle back to when they get to the end of the book. Maybe even when they're in the next road trip book, um, maybe you have a lesson opportunity when you come back to the first road trip book and say, why don't we play through a few of your favorites? I can almost guarantee you that this will be one of them. And maybe you take that opportunity um, to talk about legato and, right. and again, build upon um, that yeah, foundation. Yeah. So we're really big proponents um, of you know practicing on a hard yeah. surface. Can I add something? Yeah, absolutely. The idea of a key bed. A child's right. going to think that's funny. There's a bed for the right. keys. Yeah. Yep, here's the bed. Now let's press that key down mm -hmm. and see if you can feel the key bed. Now, mm -hmm. are you going to jump on the bed or are you going to rest down into right. the bed, which can really open up a conversation. <laughs> Let the child lead a little bit of that right. lesson and, and have them tell you, how are you how are you touching the key now? Are you jumping into the bed? Mm -hmm. Are you gently laying your head down on your pillow? But the key bed is a fun component for them and, and it makes them aware of that end of that key, that strike and where it comes down to. Right. Um, so for song number 14, which is called Crossing the Bridge, um, kids love crossing over. And we all know as educators that um, crossing the midline of the body is very important. Very important, yes, for the um, brain. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, all children, uh, really, of every education ability, is, uh, that is a, a good learning strategy, having them cross over their body, crossing the midline of their brain, literally the half of the body. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, students do love the action of doing that. This would be maybe a good one to pull away from the piano first so that the idea of um, it can be missing, doesn't matter, we just want them getting that action down making it smooth you could in incorporate the idea of again the floating arm in the good hand position bringing it over um, maybe having them try both ways um, mm -hmm. a lot of times we like to see the um, an, an ambidextrous application to a lesson if they're doing something with their right and maybe they're left-handed you're knowing that about them and saying for example the first road trip song you know, having them try it with their left hand finger too and their right hand finger too and maybe in crossing the bridge do they want to explore crossing over in the opposite direction and giving them the opportunity to do that also so that they're not always orienting to the right right and playing air piano is just yeah. fun yeah <laughs> so or dancing yes, yes. i don't dance <laughs> see i didn't sing in lessons and i and i don't dance either <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, moving on to song number 15. It's a sweet little song. Um, we will encourage you if the student is struggling uh, with the notational reading uh, that you just start with the left hand on this piece. Again, going back mm -hmm. to the idea of teamwork, um, you were talking about just starting with that left hand D. Right, right. Finding the Ds. How many are there, mm -hmm. right? And the idea of analysis. Well, how many beats will I get? Well, mm -hmm. Let's clap and count some of those Ds. One, two, three. Taking it off the piano first. And then when they have identified that there's two left-hand Ds, well, that's it. That's all your left hand's going to do for the song. Um, and then let's look at the right hand, the right hand, the G, A, B. Do you see that pattern appear anywhere else in this song? Well, they're going to see it in the third measure, and that helps. And now we've got the whole first line an analyzed, if you will, right. and looking at the second line. Do they see that pattern again? Yep, it's right there. It's in measure number five. Great. So now five measures are familiar to you. Let's try this on in the on the table or the hard surface. One, two, three, one. One, two, three, one. If that's too much for them, you can play the one, two, three, one, and they answer you. One, two, three, one. Again, using finger numbers if you need to. Maybe maybe amp that up. G A B D. Mm -hmm. Maybe to the song words, the songs, the lyrics, it's full time fun. But then building that layered approach if you really need to pull it back first. Right. Great. All right. So to wrap things up, uh, we've reached the end of our road trip journey here. Uh, when the student arrives at song number 18, which is Home Sweet Home, uh, once again, they are uh, touching on that main road trip theme song melody, uh, which is the farmer in the Dell. Uh, we want you to make a really, really big deal about this. Uh, it's important that you go back with the student uh, all the way to song number one. We are not necessarily saying that you need to play through it the entire road trip journey, because uh, that would probably take your whole lesson time. But we want you to make
make sure that you go back and have the student play through song number one again, which is based on the same melody, and then going to song number six where things got a little bit more layered and complicated, and then finally to song number 18 when we finally hand the reins of playing the <coughs> melody line over to the student, which is a pretty big deal once they get to this point. And I think kids are usually pretty excited by the fact that um, they are given the melody at this point. It's kind of like the big uh, victory victorious thing at the end right, of, right. of the road trip. I agree. So uh, if we had to, some advice for wrapping up the road trip? I'd say remember that you're not only teacher, you're a tour guide, and you're the builder. You're the master builder. It's, 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 uh, the tools are in front of you here to lay a really wonderful foundation for all future learning, um, to see the child where they are, meet them there, assume competence, of course, initially, and then adjust either speeding up or pulling back and um, doing uh, other detours and, and uh, following the map of that child's experience um, as best meets their needs. Right. And most importantly, have fun with mm -hmm. them. Uh, as a teacher, try and let go of your own agenda and what you would like to be getting accomplished and just have fun with the student. Um, there will be progress. Sometimes there may be stagnation, and that's okay. Sometimes there may be backsliding. That's okay, too. Uh, your job is to support and to always lend support and to keep gently pushing when, when needed and mm -hmm. know, know when to pull back on the reins. But most importantly, have fun. Full-time fun. Full-time fun. Full fun. It's the only way to go. <laughs> Bye, everyone.